Please welcome Mr. Hajime Fusa and Mr. Andrew McCack of Nomura Asset Management and our moderator, Kuntanong Kantong. แขกผู้มีเกียรติสวัสดีอีกครั้งหนึ่งครับเข้าสู่รายการที่3ของงานในวันนี้นะครับโดยหัวข้อเรื่องจะเป็น Japan's New Catalyst for Growth นะครับวันนี้แขกผู้เข้าร่วมรายการนะครับมิสเตอร์ฟูซันเนี่ยจะเป็นผู้ที่เชี่ยวชาญทางด้านแมกโรอีโคโนมิกส์นะครับหรือว่าเศรษฐศาสตร์มหาภาคของทางด้านญี่ปุ่นนะครับส่วนคุณแอนดรูเนี่ยจะเป็น Equity Strategist นะครับหรือว่านักยุทธศาสตร์ทางด้านตลาดหุ้นของทางด้านญี่ปุ่นวันนี้เราโชคดีนะครับมีตัวแทนของทางด้านโนมุระเนี่ยมาอยู่กับเรานะครับคิดว่าหัวข้อนี้น่าจะเป็นที่สนใจเป็นอย่างมากเลยนะครับจะใช้เวลาประมาณสัก40นาทีข้างหน้าเนี่ยที่จะเฟ้นคำตอบนะครับจากคุณฟูซานว่าเศรษฐกิจญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยมีการฟื้นตัวจริงๆแล้วหรืออย่างหลังจากที่ลุ่มๆดอนๆนมาตลอดนะครับโดยเฉพาะยิงหลังจากที่มีการใช้อาเบนอมิกส์มาเนี่ยทำให้ญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยฟื้นอย่างฟื้นจากภาวะดิฟเลชันหรือว่าภาวะเงินฝืดหรือ,อยังและก็ที่สําคัญเหมือนกันนะครับก็คือแนวโน้มของตลาดหุ้นของญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยเป็นอย่างไรนะครับวันนี้เนี่ยจะซักคุณแอนดรูให้คุณแอนดรูเนี่ยบอกให้เราทราบนะครับว่าไอ้ตัวแรงผลักดันของตลาดหุ้นญี่ปุ่นเป็นอย่างไรที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยไปได้ดีมากเลยนะครับถึงแม้ว่าเศรษฐกิจอาจจะไม่ค่อยดีเท่าไหร่แต่ว่าตลาดหุ้นของญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยดูเหมือนว่านะครับจะไปได้ดีมากๆเลยอะไรเป็นสาเหตุทําให้ตลาดหุ้นของญี่ปุ่นดูเหมือนว่าจะแยกออกจากกันจากปัจจัยพื้นฐานของทางด้านเศรษฐกิจญี่ปุ่นเป็นประเทศเฉพาะอย่างที่ไม่เหมือนใครอย่างไรเพราะฉะนั้นวันนี้เราจะมาคุยกันเรื่องญี่ปุ่นเจาะลึกเลยทีเดียวนะครับ Uh, hello, welcome to uh, our session today, Mr. Fushan, and also Andrew. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> yes, I was telling the audience uh, that uh, today we'd like to uh, get uh, perspectives from you mm -hmm. on the uh, Japanese economic recovery. Finally, is it for real mm -hmm. or not? And also prospects, you know, of the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Andrew will uh, tell us in details about his. Uh, strategy in stock picks, uh, uh, prospects, you know, of, of the new Jap Japanese uh, companies, and, and and also the growth, you know, going forward. Mm -hmm. Let me start with you, Mr. f u s a n yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Japan faced lost decades mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s, in the uh, uh, 2000s, uh, after the stock market bubbles, you know, went mm -hmm. bust. Uh, but then recently, it appeared to many people that Japan has started to recover. In your opinion, uh, do you see or do you start to see uh, lights you know, at the end of the tunnel? Sawadee kap, pom pom chu fusa kap. And uh, thank you for your introduction, and I'm very happy to be here to discuss Japanese stock market with you, uh, and the economy uh, with you. Uh, although Japanese economy and Japanese stock markets are not the same, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, I'll discuss about the Japanese economy. It is true that the uh, Japanese economy has been uh, in a, a deflationary period for the last 20 years, and it is called a lost uh, two decades. And uh, yeah, that's right. It, it, this, this is a chart from 1994, and uh, in 2000 there was a, a internet bubble, and also in 2008 uh, there was a Lehman shock. And, but the Japanese economy is a matured economy, and it, it has been almost flat. But if you can just take a look at here, it has started to uh, pick up a little bit. Prime Minister Abe took office in December 2012, and uh, Abenomic started from uh, around 2013. And uh, recently, uh, economic growth rate posted 
six consecutive quarters positive growth. The growth rate is not so high, but the six consecutive quarterly positive was quite good. In the past, it was mostly negative or positive, just positive negative, but recently it has become positive. And uh, so uh, as a whole, a Japanese economy is getting out of deflation. It's not deflation any longer. Unemployment rate is 3%, almost full employment. So it's not, it's not recession at all. Just the growth rate is slow, but Japanese economy is in the uh, moderately expanding situation. Mm. It's not inflation, but it's not deflation any longer. Mm. So uh, Japanese economy is uh, moderately expanding, so that is the current situation. Okay, uh, so uh, Mr. Fusan said that uh, the Japanese economy has already uh, uh, recovered you know, from the deflationary period, sure. no longer facing any def deflation, deflationary pressure. Not, not deflation, o okay. of course the... Uh, uh, but there's still very low inflation. Yeah, low inflation, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. My growth rate. What is the growth rate for? Mm -hmm. for what is the growth rate for Japan mm -hmm. this year? Yeah, actually, the uh, perhaps our economists think this year's real economic growth rate would be maybe 1.8 percent mm -hmm. or 2 percent. Okay. Actually, the uh, from June to uh, uh, from April to June period, uh, quarterly growth rate was 4 percent on annualized basis, but maybe it was too good. Okay. So maybe two or less than two percent. How about next year? Next year also around the same, 1.5 to 1.8 percent yeah. in terms of uh, so your economy. projections is uh, mm -hmm. a bit higher than the IMF's. Hmm? The, your projections are a uh, bit maybe higher a than bit. the IMF. The IMF said that uh, mm -hmm. Japanese economy might grow 1.6, 1.7 percent, sure, uh, 1.8 percent this year. Yeah. Next year it might slump back below one percent. Uh, yeah. It's difficult to say, but after the uh, very high growth rate in the uh, April to June quarter, maybe IOM's projection was made before that. Okay. So we have revised our estimated a little bit higher. Okay. And uh, recently, uh, personal consumption is getting stronger, and also private capital investment is also getting stronger. N not as strong as the ASEAN nations. Yeah. So it's slow, but uh, gradually, yeah, recovering. Let's, um, let's move on to Andrew. Uh, in spite of uh, some of the negative headlines uh, about Japan, but then the Japanese stock market has delivered you know, one of the most you know, outstanding performances. What have been the underlying reasons you know, for, for the uh, quite spectacular performance you know, of the mm -hmm. Japanese stock market? Well, I think it's basically that the market is starting to look at the corporate fundamentals. Now, we mentioned in the previous graph that you know, the GDP growth has been about 1%, very flat, essentially, for a long period of time. But you saw the stock market has risen quite heavily. And this year, the fiscal year ending in March of 2018, we're expecting corporate profits to increase by about 15%, which is a very large difference from the GDP. So there's been a somewhat decoupling between the economy and the stock market. Uh, and the main reason for that is because the stock market is following the corporates. And the corporate story is very, very different from the Japanese economy. Mm. So from your perspective, the market is not too expensive uh, at the moment. Mm. Uh, from the uh, price earning ratios, uh, what is, uh, what's the, the, the figure now? Right, so price earnings here, it says 14.2. I think the most recent figure is a little bit closer to 15. Okay. But essentially, there's a misconception right now that the Japanese market is overpriced because it's uh, the Nikkei is close to the 20,000 yen ceiling, psychological ceiling, and the topics is around 1,600 yen, which is about where the recent peak has been over the last five years. So there's a misconception that it's expensive, but as you can see from these valuations, especially compared to the states, we're still very attractively valued. And part of that, again, is because the earnings have been growing so significantly in Japan. So the Japanese market is still cheaper than the U.S. market? Absolutely. I see. Mr. Fusen, uh, from a score of 1 to 10, how would you rate the performance of Abenomics? You've been following Abenomics. You are a big fan of Abenomics, aren't you? I'm not enthusiastic <laughs> for Abenomics, but it is true that the uh, uh, Abenomics consisted of three uh, arrows. Mm -hmm. 
monetary. One, number one, bold monetary policy okay. by Bank of Japan. Second one is flexible uh, fiscal stimulus okay. policy. Number three is growth strategy to stimulate private investment. Okay. So these three. Okay. So as for the first monetary uh, policy, after Mr. Kuroda took office in April 2013, actually before Prime Minister Abe took office, Japanese yen was traded at 80 yen, or less, below 80 yen to US dollar. Before the Lehman shock, it was 120 yen. And after the Lehman shock, it became below 80, 76 yen. So it was very difficult for Japanese export-oriented companies. But after Mr. Kuroda took office, uh, Bank of Japan started quantitative easing, like FRB and ECB, and yen went back to 100, 120, came back to the 120. So uh, uh, correction of extreme strength of the yen has been uh, supported by monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So and Japanese corporate profit also uh, recovered, and the Nikkei index was around 8,000 yen in 2012, but now it reached to 20,000 yen. So from that, and uh, it was 20,000 yen before the Lehman shock. And uh, so from that perspective, monetary policy was successful. And second, second uh, is flexible uh, fiscal stimulus policy. Uh, it was, to some extent, it has been uh, uh, supporting the Japanese stock market, uh, mm -hmm. Japanese economy. Uh, construction for earthquake prevention or disaster uh, preparedness and also uh, construction work for towards Olympics. It will be accelerated from here. And uh, yeah, it has been doing very well. But one thing it was a bit uh, negative for the stock market was, or economy was, uh, increased the uh, consumption tax, sales tax mm. from uh, five to 8% mm. in 2014. So it detracted economic growth. Okay. Uh, so maybe that was a, a kind of... His mistake. Uh, perhaps. Uh, I won't say mistake, but uh, it, it was a pity. And the so, third, third one... So have the Japanese businessmen forgiven uh, the, the Mr. Abe on this? So Mr. Abe postponed the uh, raise of consumption, consumption tax, tax okay. twice, and the next timing would be October 2019. So I'm not sure if he will go ahead with this. It will depend on the economic conditions. And the third one is the uh, uh, growth strategy to stimulate uh, private investment. Uh, to some extent, it has been uh, it, so uh, about this. This is sometimes uh, successful, but there are many areas which are not successful. Uh, as for the uh, structural reform, like uh, uh, special economic zones or deregulation, uh, it is not enough. So people say it is not enough. Maybe true. Okay. But uh, as for which relates to the stock market, corporate governance reform, as, as John said about Korea, Japan is also, uh, uh, Japanese government is taking the initiative for corporate, corporate governance reform. So what grade uh, do in you give to in, in, in total from yeah, 1 so to 10? Monetary policy, maybe 8 out of 10. And uh, uh, fiscal stimulus policy, maybe uh, 7. Mm -hmm. And uh, growth strategy maybe six, so in total maybe seven. Okay, yeah. so, so you so give Abedomics a passing grade. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned uh, that the the strong performance of the stock market, in spite of uh, the uh, uh, economic recovery, which is which might not be as impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be a decoupling, you know, of corporate performance vis-a-vis uh, sure. -vis the. The economy. Uh, can you explain further on that? You know how uh, the, the the Japanese uh, uh, companies been able to to capture on the growth opportunities in mm -hmm. spite of the uh, somewhat lagged you know uh, right. econ economy. Um, I think the simple answer is that Japanese corporations are becoming more and more multinational and more global, mm. and so. Obviously, you have the easy examples like the auto sector. I know Dr. Thrin was explaining in the keynote speech that you have you know, your Toyotas and Hondas and Isuzu are here in Thailand. But even uh, companies that are you know, retail companies that are mainly looked at as domestic demand related stocks, 
uh, like Uniqlo, fast retailing is becoming a global stock. Mm. You have 7-Elevens I saw down the street from here on the way in from the airport. So I mean, that's a Japanese company. So even retail companies are expanding their portfolios overseas. Uh, and so that's probably the main reason why it's not linked so closely to the Japanese economy anymore. Mm. So uh, in this case, they are not contributing to employment uh, situation in Japan. Well, uh, there's still a large amount of jobs in Japan. Obviously, you said unemployment was 3%. It's not a matter of uh, there's not a lack of jobs out there. In mm -hmm. fact, obviously, we're facing a lack of labor going forward with the population dec decreasing going forward. But um, there's, they're still contributing to the Japanese economy. It's just that the corporate earnings are uh, moving abroad. Mr. Fuse, uh, last week, North Korea oh. launched its missiles mm. across Hokkaido. Hokkaido. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. At that time, what were you doing? Were you aware <laughs> you know, of this incident? Yeah, uh, it was before 6 o'clock in the morning, Japan time. And usually I watch uh, TV about the uh, market uh, in, in Europe and uh, uh, America, and uh, there, there was a program, and uh, it started from 5.45, and what I was watching that, the uh, moderator was talking about the uh, uh, debt ceiling issue of the U.S., and the uh, commentator was started to talk about this. But suddenly, the pro TV screen was interrupted by the uh, government announcement mm. that the uh, North Korea missile is, has been shot, and uh, you have to uh, evacuate. Uh, you well, have to be you careful. Shocked? Were you shocked? Uh, okay, yeah, but it, well, I was surprised, but uh, it is Hokkaido, it's very far, okay. and also <laughs> the uh, missile is not targeted to Japan, okay. it was just flying over okay. to Japan, <laughs> and uh, it's in the orbit, it's not the, uh, you cannot see, see this, mm. so uh, in fact I didn't uh, worry at all, so I was, I was waiting for the uh, commentator start about the U.S. debt ceiling issue, okay. but they, they didn't stop. Okay. How about uh, Andrew? What were uh, you doing? At it was that too time? early in the morning for me. I was asleep. <laughs> uh, but we did receive alarms on our uh, phones. So we have an alert from the government on our phone when I woke up. To be perfectly honest, I wake up around 6 in the morning, so I thought it was my regular alarm, and I just kind of put, hit snooze and didn't worry about it until I woke mm -hmm. up. But um, as Fusasan said, you know, it went in orbit over Japan. It's not like we could see the missile or anything. Uh, and they've been doing testing for years now, and it wasn't anything more, more significant than what they've done in the past. Mm. So in your opinion, uh, since Japan is a very, I mean, a neighbor, you know, of, the, uh, of Korea mm. uh, in general, how should this issue be resolved peacefully? Do you think that it's time that Japan or the, I mean, the participants uh, in, in this conflict or the, the players mm -hmm. should come forward you know, with a bold proposal to, mm -hmm. to resolve the conflict in a peaceful manner. From your perspective, how, mm -hmm. how should we avoid the escalation you know, of the conflict? A very difficult question. I, I am not in the position to predict what Mr. Kim Jong-un and Mr. Trump have in mind. But... Uh, 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 I hope, uh, in fact, as, as John... But then Japan stands to get affected because of your proximity to, to, to North yeah, Korea. Yeah, of course. It, if, if there is the uh, military conflict and uh, Japan is hosting a lot of uh, U.S. military bases mm. and uh, Kim Jong-un is actually saying that yeah, they can be a target uh, from their retaliation if the U.S. strikes first. Uh, so we, we have to worry about that. But uh, as previous uh, John of Invesco said, uh, we hope uh, they are not crazy. And uh, if they are logical, Kim Jong-un is doing to protect his kingdom, protect his uh, regime. But once he strikes first, it, he will be destroyed. He's not doing this to be destroyed. So if he's logical, I don't think he, he will go too, uh, too far. But some miscalculation may happen. Uh, so, we, so this uncertainty remains, uh, but we don't, I don't think, personally, I don't think it will lead to the uh, catastrophic situation, so we have to be uh, used to live with this uh, uncertainty for the time being. Mm -hmm. Andrew, can you also uh, tackle this uh, question mm. uh, in this perspective of investors? How do they factor in the, the risk of the 
North Korean right. crisis. Right, so since the missile test and the nuclear test that went on last week, obviously the market has dipped slightly, uh, but it hasn't been a significant impact on the market. So you can see that the market is not expecting anything catastrophic either. Uh, and the, if the Japanese market declines more severely than other markets, really I think it's an opportunity to buy in uh, because you know, if something, if there's militaristic action, it's not an issue of just Korea and Japan because of the proximity. It's the proximity. It's a global issue. Uh, and so if for some reason Japan is oversold, I think there's an opportunity to enter the market there. Hmm. But then the short-term uh, repercussions or the short-term impact you know, of the uh, North Korean incidents, that stock markets went down. But then again, went up. That's right. And then I read in the uh, headline stories, Japanese yen has become a safe haven currency. Mm, that's right. So, so how safe is the Japanese yen? Uh, actually, Japanese yen has been uh, said to be safe haven currency for a long time. Whenever there is some crisis, like European crisis or Lehman shock, or even Japanese earthquake in 2011, a Japanese yen appreciate, and this time also Japanese yen appreciate at the time of risk of investor sentiment. The reason is because Japan, Japan, uh, Japan as a nation is a net creditor nation. Japan as a nation has much more asset than it owes to foreign countries. If you take a look at the balance sheet of Japan as a nation, not only public sector, public sector is a deficit, but private sector is very rich. So. Uh, Japan has overseas assets of around 8.5 trillion dollars, Japan as a whole, and Japan has a liability, or foreigners own Japanese assets around uh, 5.5 uh, 5, 5 trillion dollars. So the difference is 3 trillion dollars. That is the largest in the world. The next largest net credit nation is China, and then Germany. And uh, Switzerland is also a net credit nation, having more asset overseas than they owe to foreigners. So usually Japanese yen, Swiss franc, and in the past, German mark was bought as safe haven currency. But now there is no German mark. So that's why Japanese yen and Swiss franc mm -hmm. are bought as a safe haven currency. Okay, in your opinion, what should be the appropriate level of the yen uh, at the moment? Uh, diff difficult. <laughs> you uh, you ask very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, yeah. Uh, so just there are two or... two opinions. From the uh, uh, quantitative easing perspective, uh, Japan is still easing. Bank of Japan is easing. Federal Reserve stopped easing and maybe reducing the asset. So from that perspective, Japanese yen should be a weaker because U.S. is tightening. Okay. Japan is not tightening. But Japan is the uh, current account surplus countries having surplus in terms of trade and income from abroad. That's why Japan is the uh, largest credit nation in the world, the wealthiest country in the world. And so from that perspective, Japanese yen has to be stronger. So when uh, this kind of risk of sentiment will uh, uh, stop, maybe yen can go back to 112 or something. But uh, as long as this kind of uncertainty remains, maybe it can go up to uh, 105 or even 100 yen to the dollar. Okay. Andrew, you uh, watch the, uh, you manage uh, the uh, portfolio uh, mm -hmm. from bottom up. Yes. Uh, how do you go about uh, picking stocks, you know, uh, uh, it, within this kind of, uh, of environment now? With regards to the yen, um, well, first off, I, my team and I run a value fund. So we're looking for undervalued stocks, but we're also looking for quality names within the value realm. So not too deep value, but a combination of undervaluation and potential, as we call it. And to be honest, we don't look at the world as predicting the yen to be 120 yen or 100 yen and trying to uh, put more exporters or domestic related stocks in the portfolio. Rather, we look at it uh, from a company, on a company basis. If the yen moves one yen, how much does that impact that, the earnings of that company? Uh, and obviously, 
uh, at around 110 yen where it's right, right now, it gives uh, the pricing power to many Japanese companies within Asia for things like electronic components uh, and automobiles and things have an advantageous rate right now. And if it goes below 100 yen, that's when it causes serious problems from a competitive standpoint. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as, it, as the yen strengthens, it impacts the earnings directly in the short term, but we're looking at the competitiveness of companies, and we don't believe that that'll be impacted significantly until it reaches close to 100 yen. So at the rate at it's right, at right now, uh, we have a balance between domestic stocks and exporters. I see. So how do you view the, the uh, performance of the market this year and, and then also next year? Right, so as I mentioned earlier, that the correlation between the corporate earnings and the fundamentals uh, and the stock market returns have uh, become much closer uh, and much stronger recently. So we're expecting 15% growth in operating profits. We expect the market to grow similarly. Uh, so far this year, it's up about 7.7%, I believe, through the end of August. This is topics, not the Nikkei. Um, but I think that it's doing well, but obviously with the geopolitical risk, uh, and some risk-off movements, there's certain short-term uh, you know, decline, but I think those are opportunities to buy, and I think that we're going to have strong performance this year. We're expecting operating profits for companies to grow 10% in the following fiscal year as well. So over the midterm, we think there's uh, strong uh, opportunities in Japan. So in other words, next year going to be better than, than this year? No, the earnings Not this quite. year we're expecting 15% okay. and then 10% the following 10%, year. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Fusa, the uh, latest indications from the Bank of Japan is that uh, the monetary easing will continue mm. until you achieve the uh, inflation target of 2%. Mm. But you mentioned earlier that inflation is now only 1%. That's right. Yeah. So there is still a long, long way mm. to go before the Bank of Japan mm. may achieve mm -hmm. its target. If the target is unachievable, mm -hmm. isn't it better you know, to, to just remove it, not to yeah. pay attention you know, to, or have any uh, uh, inflation target? Yeah, uh, the, uh, it's, is this the uh, a balance sheet? Yeah. This is the uh, index chart of the uh, balance sheet of three major central banks. The uh, blue is Federal Reserve, uh, green is ECB, and uh, yellow is Bank of Japan. And actually, immediately after the uh, Lehman shock in 2008, Federal Reserve and uh, ECB started monetary easing, balance sheet expansion. But the Bank of Japan was very slow. That's why Japanese yen appreciated from 120 to 80 yen, or below 80 yen, and stayed there for four years. But after Abenomics started, Bank of Japan also started to uh, implement or implemented monetary easing policy. Then Japanese yen came back to 120 yen. So since uh, Bank of Japan started massive quantitative easing four years later, than FRB and the ECB, the exit will also be later, perhaps. It is very natural. And uh, since FRB will be tapering, ECB is still expanding. Uh, but we are not sure what, what Mr. Juragi will say this tomorrow. And the Bank of Japan uh, is still uh, in, in expanding. But recently, the uh, pace of increase of balance sheet has been slowed. Bank of Japan has shifted its target, monetary policy target, from balance sheet expansion to interest rate, interest rate level. So, and At zero percent. Zero percent for short, zero percent, that, that's right, zero okay. percent for 10 year bond. So, uh, even if Bank of Japan will continue its monetary easing, it's not necessarily balance sheet expansion. So, uh, uh, but if the economy is getting it is already getting better, and uh, there is a labor shortage, there is no unemployment rate problem. Uh, in that case, uh, people may think it is, you don't, Bank of Japan does not have to stick to 2% inflation. Mr. Kuroda's term will, will end in April next year, so he may continue, he may be re-elected, but uh, there may be new governor, we are not sure, but maybe next April is a timing to uh, maybe review uh, if they will continue this monetary easing policy 
Uh, they will continue, I think, but the, uh, how they will continue will be uh, a different issue, maybe a little bit slower. Okay. Andrew, can I follow up on this? Uh, part of the reason that the, the Japanese stock market has been doing well is uh, uh, the Bank of Japan's buying of the ETF, um, about two-thirds you know, of all the, the ETF. So what, what will happen down the road you know, in the event that uh, Bank of Japan start to withdraw its support both you know, in the uh, Japanese government bonds and also uh, yes. e e the ETF? Uh, because somewhere along the line, you, right. you need to, 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 to slow back. Right. Um, I think what we need to be careful about here, though, is that obviously they need to scale back their purchasing, but whether or not they'll start selling their position is a diff different story. I think mm -hmm. that that's, they may stop their purchasing because obviously if they keep going at this rate, they're going to own the entire market, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not feasible. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously in the short term, if something like this would happen, the market will probably drop probably 20% or so. But I think, again, you saw the valuations earlier. They're very cheap still. It's an opportunity to buy in, I think. And it's not something that uh, we've really put into our forecasts. Okay. Yeah, to to uh, supplement, Bank of Japan's buying of ETF is now 6 trillion yen per year. And the market capitalization of Tokyo Stock Exchange is 600 trillion yen. So 1% of market cap is the uh, pace that Bank of Japan is buying. Now, uh, I think Bank of Japan has around 18, 18 trillion yen cumulative ETF, so which is equivalent to 3% of total market capitalization of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. I'm not sure whether this is big or small, but uh, since they are not selling, may maybe that, that has a supporting factor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, recent polls, political polls, Opinion polls uh, appear to indicate that uh, Mr. Chinso Abe uh, has lost support mm -hmm. from the Japanese people. Mm. Uh, Letters rating about 30 percent, or uh, 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 actually, uh, there was some uh, scandal, and also he, he looked very arrogant. So uh, <laughs> at the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly election in July. Uh, the uh, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, he's, he's a president of the LDP, uh, lost uh, half the seat in the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly, and the approval rating plunged to below 40%, below 40%. Uh, in the past, it was above 60%. But he made a, a cabinet reshuffle on 3rd of August. And after that, uh, it recovered now to 44%, it is still lower than 60% in the past, but it stopped falling and recovered to some extent. And uh, uh, actually, in September next year, there will be ele presidential election of the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP. And uh, he may run for his third term, or he may voluntarily step down. We are not sure. In Japan, the uh, leader of the... Do you the want to see him coming back to power? Uh, personally? Uh, uh, personally, I, I do not have any... Uh, I'm not a friend of him, so uh, he, he may stay if he like, or uh, he, he may step down. <laughs> but the uh, LDP, the Democratic Party, remain in power. It has the majority in the uh, lower, both lower house and the uh, upper house. Uh, so LDP's rule will continue. So even if he will be replaced by somebody else, it will be also a member of the LDP. So basic economic policy framework will continue. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to jump in there and add the fact that, listen, I understand that the approval rating dropped to closer to 30%, but the opposition doesn't have any approval either. So there's not an opposing party. And so Abenomics has been very helpful for the corporate story and that support of government being stable is very key for the stock market. Okay. Uh, and so the fact that it's unlikely that the LDP will lose power, whether Abe is the president of the LDP or not, is crucial for go, uh, the Japanese market going forward. Okay. Also, the fact that it dropped means that Abe can't enforce his will with regards to the constitution and the military, and he might need to concentrate back on the economy again in order to regain some of that approval. Okay. So that should be positive for the Japanese economy. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, uh, can you tell us about the latest uh, technology developments uh, 
technology, sure. Yeah, among, among Japanese companies. Uh, in US, you have Amazon. In China, you have Alibaba. Do you have the equivalent of those two companies in <laughs> Japan or not? Yeah, unfortunately, Japanese companies, when it comes to tech, can't compete to Silicon Valley. Interestingly enough, Alibaba, a major shareholder of Alibaba is SoftBank, which is a Japanese company. So you can get exposure to Alibaba if you want in the Japanese market. Rather than that, though, uh, where Japan is a leader is in something I like to call enabling technologies. Technologies that you can't really see yourself, but they're hidden in everything from smartphones to vehicles to any number of things. In the previous session, uh, John mentioned that Korea is a leader in semiconductors. And while that's true, Japan, there's Japanese companies that are leaders when it comes to semiconductor equipment or semiconductor materials. For example, Shinets Chemical is the leader when it comes to silicon wafers. And so there's ways to get uh, exposure to those th ideas from Japanese companies as things like the Internet of Things and the autonomous vehicles becoming more prevalent. You're going to need more sensors and actuators and you're going to need more semiconductors. Uh, and not just that, you're going to need to have more high-end semiconductors that can, are heat resistant if they're close to the engine or close to the battery in a vehicle. And so the high quality materials is another area that Japan is very strong in. Uh, you want to make vehicles more lightweight and so carbon fiber has become kind of a theme and Tore, uh, along with two other Japanese companies, own about 70% of the global share for carbon fibers. So new materials is another area we think that it's not technology as we you know, would define it traditionally, but I think that if you expand that to what I like to call enabling technologies, there are several Japanese companies that would benefit. Mm. So you really think that uh, Japan won't be left behind in the technology development you know, uh, compared to, to other countries. But then in terms of e-commerce, e-commerce is slow uh, to mm. uh, get going in, in Japan. Yeah, obviously when you talk about e-commerce, you're gonna go straight to China and look at that as kind of the prime example, and Japan is way behind that, but it's still growing. I think as the population ages, you're gonna need more and more like e-commerce. Uh, and actually, we, we've invested in a company called Toyota Industries, where um, their main line of business is forklifts. And so globally, they're seeing, I think they own about 35 to 40% of the global share of forklifts. And not just in Japan, but in China and the States, everywhere you're gonna see larger, larger, uh, investment into distribution centers and into forklifts. So that's one area we're trying to get exposure to e-commerce. Aging society is a big problem, mm -hmm. not only in Japan, but also in yeah. Korea, mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. yeah. and now mm -hmm. Thailand. Oh. Can you explain to us how serious mm. is the aging mm -hmm. uh, uh, population is posing a challenge to, 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 to Japan, mm -hmm. and what's the leadership is doing about this? Mm. Actually, this is uh, what the government has to think seriously. Although this is the uh, global problem, Japan is quite advanced in this area. And uh, actually, last year, 1.3 uh, million people died, while <laughs> 1 million people, 1 million babies were born. So on net basis, 0 0.3 million uh, population decreased. Japanese population is around 125 million. So around... So eventually there won't be any Japanese <laughs> huh? on the island. <laughs> there are Japanese. So uh, the population declined 0 0.2, 0 0.3% last year, maybe this year too. So what the government would like to do is raising the birth rate. At this moment, birth rate or fertility rate is 1.4. And uh, three or four, uh, four, five years ago it was 1.2 something. So it has risen a little bit, but uh, the government would like to subsidize uh, uh, mothers who have second or third child. So that is one thing. And also, so, so raising the birth rate is also uh, is very important. And also in order to uh, cope with the uh, aging population, actually population itself is not a, I don't think population itself is the problem because Japanese population 150 years ago was 30 million. And uh, 70 years ago, after World War II, at that time, se Japanese population was 72 million. It's 125 million, quite big, historically speaking. But the problem is not the number. The uh, aging, the demographics, that is the uh, problem. So less people support the elderly. But what uh, I think uh, the answer will be, uh, change the definition of the elderly, 
Now the uh, definition of the working population is from 15 years old to 64. But 64 is still very young. So government is extending the retirement age for the elderly and also uh, extending the uh, receipt of public pension. In the past it was 60, but now 65. Retirement age has also been extended from 60 to 65. And perhaps it can be extended further. That is one thing. And second is the uh, more women working. There are many housewives which were not working in the past. But recently, female labor participation rate in Japan has risen. Maybe this is also uh, one of the success of Abenomics. It's now 75% higher than that of the US. So that is, and the mo perhaps more women can, can work. Uh, although it is 75%, most of them are part-time workers. And so increasing the child care centers, babysitting system, uh, that is also the uh, measures which the government is doing. The third one is robotics. Because of the labor shortage, factory automation, robotics has become even more important than before. Japanese companies are quite good at robotics, factory automation, mm. uh, equipment, uh, as and Andrew said. And uh, so current situation, if e even uh, accelerate the uh, innovation of robotics factory automation by Japanese companies. And also there are new services for elderly people, healthcare, and the Japanese government is saying to create a society of health life expectancy. Healthy life expectancy, mm -hmm. where all citizens uh, can work uh, uh, you know, uh, in a very flexible manner. Andrew, do you want to work until 65 or not? Personally, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I also know from looking at my parents, my father is 65 now, and he doesn't want to quit because he has nothing to do when he's at home. So I understand that perhaps my opinion will change. That being said, currently, no. Can you elaborate? Final questions you know, on uh, Mr. Fusa's uh, mentioning about uh, the employment of automation or robotics. Uh, sure. Uh, because if there is a crisis, you won't let a crisis go uh, wasted. <laughs> right. Um, so Japan, you've got several names like Fanuc, Kians, uh, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, that are leaders in factory automation and robotics. Uh, I forgot to mention them earlier when you were talking about technology. I should have. Um, but it's not just about uh, you know, the population decrease and shortage of labor in Japan. It's also about the increase of cost of labor in, here in Asia as well. And it's moving more and more towards robotics. And there's, uh, China is very focused on increasing factory automation. Um, and so it's an area that is uh, prime for growth going forward, absolutely. เอ่อเซสชั่นนี้นะครับเอ่อทั้ง 2 มิสเตอร์ฟูซานี่ให้คะแนนผ่านนะครับอเวนโนมิกส์เนี่ยสอบผ่านนะครับเอ่อจากเซ็นแต่ว่าบริษัทของญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยตอนนี้อินเตอร์เนชั่นแนลไลซ์มากๆคือไปประกอบธุรกิจอยู่ต่างจะนําหุ้นอเมริกาหรือว่าในจีนก็มีความคึกคักทางด้าน e-commerce แต่ว่าญี่ปุ่นเนี่ย
หรือว่าเก่งเก่งทางด้านเทคโนโลยีซึ่งเรามองไม่เห็นนะครับไม่ว่าจะเป็นพวกเลเซอร์ไม่ว่าจะเป็นพวกแบตเตอรี่ไม่ว่าจะเป็นพวกอุปกรณ์พวกโรบอติกส์หรือว่าหุ่นยนต์ต่างๆญี่ปุ่นเนี่ยเชี่ยวชาญนะครับแต่ว่าธุรกิจเหล่านี้มันไม่ออกมาแต่ว่าเขาอยู่ในพื้นที่เขาก็มองเห็นแล้วก็มองเห็นโอกาสนะครับสรุปโดยภาพรวมญี่ปุ่นยังมีอนาคตสดใสนะครับถึงแม้ว่าก็ต้องอาจจะบางครั้งเกาหลีเหนือยิงมาก็ต้องทําใจหรือว่าทําอืมนะครับว่าเออมันผ่านมาแล้วก็ผ่านไปก็หวังว่ามหาอำนาจอะไรต่างๆทั้งหลายจะสามารถตกลงปัญหา North Korea ได้ครับสำหรับรายการวันนี้เวลาหมดลงพอดีนะครับเดี๋ยวพบกับเซสชั่นใหม่ต่อไปนะครับผมคุณครูซ่าเซนตรูต้องขอลาก่อนครับสวัสดีครับ Thank you.